We're going to be talking today about um, the effect of the economy and the state's bad budget on the safety net and uh, California's most vulnerable populations. Um, I think it's obviously this is a, a problem that you, we see everywhere, but uh, for those of us in California, we know that it's especially hard hitting here. I mean, the, last week PPSC released a poll that found 90% of the state of California adults believe that we're in a recession. 50% believe it's a serious recession. Um, and 50% of California adults today believe that they or someone in their immediate family will lose a job or fear they'll lose a job within the coming year. So in addition to that anxiety, obviously, California has the second highest unemployment rate in the country. We are ground zero for the housing foreclosure crisis. And as we all know, that we're, we're, um, we have one of the most difficult state budgets of any place in the country for the last several years. So given those unique challenges for California, we have a great panel today to really look, take a close up look at the California safety net and what these changes and, and pressures have done to the safety net, what, how things look um, from a couple different perspectives and, and looking ahead at what we might uh, hope or expect to see in, in coming months. Um, I'll introduce our panelists in just a second, uh, but just a, a one word about format. Uh, each panelist will um, talk for about 10 minutes, um, and then uh, I will ask a couple of questions as the moderator, and then we'll open it up to questions for, for whatever time we have <coughs> left at the end. Um, first, uh, I, I'll introduce our speakers, and then we'll, and then we'll start. Um, start with Jean Ross. Our Jean Ross will be our first speaker and she's going to talk about um, the economic and budget and demographic trends underway in terms of uh, uh, issues of poverty and, and vulnerable populations. As many of you know, um, Jean, is, as somebody mentioned today, is a rock star in Sacramento and, and probably responsible for a lot of this audience. Um, Jean is uh, the, the executive director of the California Budget Project, which is a nonprofit organization that studies the fiscal and economic policies that affect low and middle income Californians. Uh, and previously, she also worked in the state capitol on, a, on a couple committees that overlap with budget issues and human services issues. Um, second, we will hear from Caroline Danielson. Uh, Caroline is a policy fellow at uh, PPIC. Uh, who got her PhD at the University of Michigan and has worked for several years at PPIC on issues related to welfare and safety net programs. Um, Caroline released a report in May um, that looked at the, uh, Governor Brown's uh, realignment proposal in the area of child welfare services. Um, and she released a report just last week um, about uh, food stamps, or I guess CalFresh in California, called California's Food Stamp Program Participation and Cost Challenges for the State. Um, Caroline's going to talk to us about caseload trends in some of the, the safety net programs uh, in state government. And our third speaker will be Bruce Wagstaff. I'm sure many of you also are very familiar with Bruce. Bruce has been uh, in, worked in this area for a long time. He's admi he is the administrator in Sacramento County's Countywide Services Agency, which oversees a, a number of county programs, but uh, certainly all of the safety net programs. Um, and uh, prior, Bruce has been with the county for a bit over six years, and prior to that he was in state government for about 30 years, um, much of it in working in the same area. I thought he was um, a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> um, it, Bruce uh, was the, uh, one of the primary architects and implementers of welfare reform in the 90s and, and served in uh, several key positions um, in state government uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, um, and he's going to be talking about you know, what, what some of these issues and pressures and trends look like from uh, where his, he's sitting in Sacramento County. So uh, why don't we get started first and we'll start with Jim Ross. Thank you. It's really a terrific turnout. I'm glad to see so many people come out. A lot of times when we talk about human services issues, sometimes we don't get the audience that I think these issues deserve. So thank you for coming today. And I want to thank Caroline for a very interesting, timely, and important report looking at 
uh, what we call the, the program formerly known as food stamps and some of the issues confronting that program in California. And I hope that we can talk about uh, some of her findings. I know she will, and then we can have a good conversation about her findings. I've been asked to, to deliver the bad news, and I'm, I'm surprised if it's a rock star. I'm a pretty gloomy rock star, and I keep hoping for the year when I get to deliver some good news about our economy and about the budget. Uh, as I think all of you know, this isn't that year. Uh, and so I'm here to, to kick things off with, with a bang. Uh, and, and in many ways, the economic and fiscal context for, for these issues is an imperfect storm. Uh, we have tremendous need that's been rising because of the weakness of the economy, the continued weakness of labor markets. At the same time, when our public systems from the county level up to the federal level are ill-prepared to meet the, the rising demand for services. And we see sort of renewed attention on balancing budgets. At the same time, uh, there, the demands on the safety net continue, likely to continue for the foreseeable future. I think you know some of you may have seen the recent UCLA economic forecast, which projects that California will have double-digit unemployment rates for at least two more years. Uh, and I think they they actually tend to be on the more optimistic end uh, of the projections there. So we are still looking at uh, a couple more very difficult years in terms of the demands on our safety net systems uh, and uh, a, a very weak economic climate. Now I'm going to run through some of the data. I'm going to try and not use too many numbers. Uh, the reports that all of the, the figures that I'll, I'll be talking about are on our website, www.cbp.org. A lot of it uh, comes from a report we released on Labor Day on the edge, which is just chock full of bad news, for those of you who like that. Um, and then we did a sequel when the Census Bureau released the most recent income and poverty statistics. So all of it is there, so if you, you miss some of the specifics, you can find it on our website. Uh, what do we know? What's the backdrop for this discussion? The share of Californians with incomes below the federal poverty line rose in 2010. That's the most recent year for which we have data uh, for the fourth straight year. Again, not surprising given the economic climate that we're in. More than six million Californians, which is about one out of six Californians, live in families with incomes below the federal poverty line. Nearly one out of four California children, which is critically important and I think deeply, deeply troubling in terms of the state's future and what that means for our future on multiple dimensions, live in families with incomes below the federal poverty line. And again, just to sort of keep in mind as we move through this discussion, for a family of four, federal poverty line is just over $22,000 a year. That means trying to raise a family of four, $22,000. It's a one-size-fits-all number, same in North Dakota as it is in California. And I think that's a, you know, particular, it, it's difficult for us here in a very high cost place to live. Um, the, what's even more troubling is that the, num the share of the population living in deep poverty, and that's defined as one half the federal poverty line, increased in the past year in 40 states, including California. About two and a half million Californians are living in deep poverty about 11,000 a year for a family of four. And again, it's indexed for family size, so that would be a somewhat lower number for single individuals, somewhat higher number for large, uh, larger families as well. Uh, and, and I think it's important to put this in context, including you know, some of the figures that I'll talk about in a minute. This isn't because of a lack of wealth 
in our society. California is still, uh, you know, we move between sort of fifth and eighth largest economy in the world, tremendous riches, rich, rich vast wealth uh, in, in California. If you look at franchise tax board data, millionaires in California, about two-tenths of the state's population, had combined incomes of about $104 billion a year. That's a little bigger than the state's general fund budget, again, to give you sort of a sense there. And it's 11 times the amount needed to lift every single Californian with an income below the poverty line out of poverty. So, you know, in, in many respects, we are living in an era with vast, has been widely documented, tremendous levels of income inequality nationally, globally, but particularly here in California. Um, why do so many people live in poverty? Weakness of the economy. Again, you know, the, we started to see some improvement at the beginning of the year, uh, largely stalled out. We're still at 12% plus unemployment. That's an incredibly weak labor market. That means uh, people don't have jobs. It means that those individuals who do have jobs are, are in a very weak place in terms of negotiating pay increases. Uh, we've also seen a tremendous reduction in work hours, which is significant because you know, a lot of employers, employers who are trying to do the right thing in this economy, have cut back hours so that they keep more people employed, but that means less income coming into to households on a weekly basis. Another thing that's very, very interesting and troubling in terms of any discussion of the safety net and particularly what it means for families and kids is going into the economic downturn, we had what a lot of pundits called a man session. And that's because it was led by the downturn in the housing market construction industry. So you saw men losing their jobs in greater numbers while women's employment held up for a while. Now we are moving into a recovery uh, where actually we've seen the unemployment rate drop for men uh, but stall for women. And that's critical because of some of the policy changes that we've seen uh, in state budgets recently. And I'm going to move quickly through some of the context in the past several very tough budget years that we've seen uh, that, that really runs at odds with what's going on in the economy. And I think as all of us, and I think in this room, you wouldn't be here if you didn't care about public policies. We would hope that our public policies would respond to and meet the demands in the external economy. What we've actually seen because of the depth and the length of our budget crisis that they've moved in opposite directions. At precisely the time when there's growing demand, there's less ability to meet that demand. We've seen deep cuts in the amount of cash assistance that flows into households repeatedly as we've moved through the very tough budget years. California welfare grant for a family of three is now at the same level that it was at in the 1987-88 fiscal year. That's not adjusted for inflation. That's the same number of dollars are flowing to families uh, as it was in the late 1980s. Uh, we've reduced a very key part of California's welfare to work law that was implemented back when I think I first met Bruce uh, back uh, in Don't say when. <laughs> some years ago when California implemented the federal welfare reform law. Um, and, and it really was a, a, a wonderful process. And I think sort of the best of how public policies are developed, California looked to some of the best practices literature, looked at some of the rigorous evaluation studies that have been done by Mathematica and MDRC and a lot of the big think tanks. California adopted a policy which allowed families to keep a small cash assistance grant as they worked their way off welfare and into the workforce. Um, when I look at sort of from a symbolic level and sort of smaller perhaps in the number of dollars both to families 
and to the state budget. One of the changes in this year's budget that I found most troubling was the fact that we took a tremendous step backwards on, on one of the policies that meets every test that you would want. Rigorously evaluates, has success, moves families into work, moves families out of poverty. We took a step backwards uh, and, and don't provide that incentive to families that are trying to do the right thing. We also reduced funding for employment services, giving people the training they need, drug alcohol services, mental health services, all the things that families need to get their lives together, get themselves ready to find work, stay in the workforce, the child care needed to, to stay in the workforce. And I will say as an employer, Stable child care is the key to stable employment. There is nothing that employers like less than employees that don't have stable child care arrangements. And that, again, particularly when we've seen this you know, stubbornly high unemployment rates for women, critically, critically important. Last but not least, as part of this year's budget agreement, the state rolled back from the 60-month the federal limit to four, less than that to 48 months the time limit for people on cash assistance. Um, it is all of the, the numbers that I've quoted before uh, suggest uh, they're not the jobs for families that are losing cash assistance. We know they're going someplace, they're in our communities, they may not be getting a cash assistance grant, but they're simply not the jobs that people need in this economy, and there won't be for a long time to come. Um, I wish I could say that things were improving. You know, the economy remains troublingly weak. You know, we get a good week, we get a bad week. Uh, difficult to project uh, what's going to happen uh, a week or two weeks from now, much less six months from now. Um, I think one of uh, the, the spots on the horizon now that the legislative session is out here in Sacramento, many of us have turned our eyes to Washington with some concern over what happens as part of efforts to balance the federal budget. The initial agreement took many of the core safety net programs off the table in recognition of the key role that they play. Uh, we're, we'll be looking to see what happens over the next several months as the super committee continues to meet. Uh, but, but I would say this is the time now more than ever that we need to look for how we can strengthen uh, and not further weaken uh, this vital component uh, of what we do to ensure the stability of California's families. Thank you very much, Jean. Caroline? Thank you. Let me start by saying it's really a great honor to be sitting at a table with both Bruce Wagstaff and, and Jean Ross um, and say that I have um, possibly a, a slightly, um, some, some slightly better news to deliver. Um, and I will be talking about um, some trends in safety net programs in California. And I will be focusing on three programs and then focusing more deeply on one, CalFresh. So the three programs that I'll be talking about are CalFresh, um, nutrition assistance or food assistance for families and individuals, um, largely federally funded, um, the state and counties bear a share of administrative costs. Also the EITC, the Federal Earned Income Tax Credit, which is entirely federally funded and run by the, um, the Internal Revenue Service and requires families have um, earnings in order to qualify. And then finally, um, CalWORKs, um, cash assistance for families with children and also employment services, as Jean mentioned. And if you look on the back side of your agenda, you'll see um, two figures. And the top one shows you recent trends in those programs. And because they all have um, somewhat different eligibility requirements, to put them on, on a more similar basis, I'm showing you changes since 2000 in annual average um, number of households in California um, making use of these benefits. And you can see in 2000 that the line crosses 100%. And because the lines are all going upwards, they've all been growing. Um, but there's a distinct difference. Um, the EITC, the latest data we have is from 2009. And Cal, CalWORKs and EITC, the growth has been what, in, as of 2009, was about 12% higher than 2007, um, <laughs> the end of which saw the beginning of the official beginning of the recession. Um, CalWORKs has continued to grow but is up about 20% in 
In comparison, CalFresh, or in um, federal jargon, the Supplemental Nut Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, um, is up 91%, um, so nearly doubled um, in the same time period. So it's really been the most responsive program in California and nationwide to the dire circumstances that Jean just um, described. And it, as I'm sure you all know, the official poverty measure does not take into account the benefits, the government benefits that families take advantage of. Um, so that when we talk about an increase in poverty, we're not factoring in um, these programs. And in a minute, I'll tell you um, about New York City's experience with when they do factor these programs in um, and what they find about their poverty rate um, when they do that. But there is a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty story in California around CalFresh. And that's your second figure. And here I'm showing you the percent of the population in California and in the rest of the United States um, making use of CalFresh um, or SNAP benefits. Um, and you see this, these numbers from the 1990s all the way through the middle of 2011. Um, and in the middle of 2011, approximately 15% of the U.S. population was getting a, a SNAP benefit. In California, it was about 10%. So these are both very large numbers, one out of 10, and more than one out of 10 in the rest of the U.S. But you can see that there's a fairly sizable differential in California, and that benefit use is higher in the United States. And the trend in recent years has been really very similar, steeply upwards. The difference that occurred, that, that the difference in trends really happened um, between 2000 and 2005 when um, benefit use, um, participation in SNAP grew substantially in the rest of the U.S. and um, stalled in California. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, there are certainly reasons why we might expect participation as a percent of the population to be lower in California. And two that often come up and are clearly um, uh, real reasons are in the high level, higher level of immigrants in California and California's SSI cash out policy. Now both of those are reasons why we might expect um, fewer people in the state to be making use of CalFresh benefits because they're ineligible or because they might be more hesitant to apply in the case of immigrants who worry about their, um, their status. At the same time, those two factors have changed either not at all or very little over the 2000s. So they're really not an explanation for the differing trends. <laughs> to gain some further insight into the differing trends, in our report, we further looked at some policy changes that might be responsible for um, um, increase in the United States that California did not experience. And let me just briefly go over three. Um, the first is considering a family's income when determining eligibility rather than a combination of both income and assets. And this is called, in technical jargon, expanded categorical eligibility or broad-based categorical eligibility. California did put this policy in place in middle of 2009 and expanded it in 2011. And this policy, we find, does increase participation. So this is something that we should have expected to um, uh, bump up the case caseload in California. Um, in recent years, and some other states implemented this earlier on, and that may be one, is one reason why um, this differential opened up. The other two policies, one of which um, is simplified reporting, or semi-annual reporting as it's called in California, um, the federal government has been urging the state to make this change for um, a number of years, and is now requiring, or nearly requiring the state to, to make this change by um, um, pushing it to, to, to renew its waiver um, every, um, s every so often, more than once a year, as I understand it. Um, we actually find that this move to semi-annual reporting will not increase participation, and this may be somewhat counterintuitive, and we explore some explanations for why that might be the case, but we actually don't find that um, reducing paperwork in the form of how many times a family needs to report to the social services office about their family income and circumstances we do not find that changing California's policy, which is currently a quarterly reporting policy to a semi-annual policy, would increase participation. We do find that California's policy of finger imaging or electronic fingerprinting would increase participation by about 7%. Um, and we explore some reasons why that might be the case um, and conclude that um, California's policy of fingerprinting, which is not required by the federal government, and it's indeed now one of, I believe, four states that has a policy of fingerprinting, um, d 
doesn't result in the state detecting more fraud, although it could be the case that it is deterring fraud that applicants who are, um, are either, uh, that its main effect is to deter, deter fraud, and it could be the case. We cannot rule out that some of those deterred applications could be due to um, fraudulent participation. So to wrap up, um, let me go back to New York City. So there is something called the Supplemental Poverty Measure, which you probably have also heard of. And this is an effort to take into account um, government programs that help people to make ends meet when they lose jobs or face work cutbacks or low wages or underemployment of whatever form. Um, and the Supplemental Poverty Measure um, factors in programs like CalFresh. And in New York City, although the federal government is ramping up to do a, a, a nationwide measure of supp the Supplemental Poverty Measure to see how poverty changes if you factor in government benefits, um, and including tax credits, um, but also programs like CalFresh and CalWORKs, um, New York City has taken the initiative to do this for their own city. And they found that, um, indeed, food stamps in New York City does reduce poverty using this new supplemental poverty measure by about 10%. So they do find that it has a real effect on um, families' well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And Bruce? Thank you very much. It is uh, great to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces. It's good to see you all. And it's really a pleasure to uh, share some observations on this very important topic. Uh, right off the bat, Gene stole my perfect storm line. That's okay. Um, I use that every time I do a panel because it is the best description, I think, that portrays what local administrators throughout the state and I'd say probably throughout the country are dealing with right now. It really is the perfect storm because caseloads in all of our programs, as has already been mentioned, are reaching all-time highs uh, while resources have been cut at unprecedented levels. So, speaking from my personal experience, um, in many ways it's without question the most difficult and challenging time that I've experienced in about 37 years of uh, public service. Um, caseloads have risen dramatically in all programs, and I was listening to um, the stats that were just presented, and our experience has been roughly the same uh, over the last couple of years. CalWORKs going up by about 20 percent food stamps um, by over 50 percent in Sacramento County and if you include just the um, non-assistance caseload in food stamps well beyond that uh, so certainly a dramatic increase there um, big increases in Medi-Cal uh, and even though we have reduced our general assistance payments uh, to the lowest levels that we are allowed to for, due to fiscal necessity that caseload keeps going up in fact in Sacramento County as we speak more than one out of every four residents of this county is served by our Department of Human Assistance. And it's approaching one out of every three, which is pretty staggering. Um, when I say that at the board, they always stop me and say, did I hear that right? Um, and I've, we've checked and double-checked those numbers to make sure those aren't unduplicated counts, you know? Um, but that is the case. And in fact, you can see the impact of all of this if you'd like to. Uh, most mornings you can drive over to our downtown welfare office at 28th and P and you'll see people lining up hours before the doors open to get in for aid. Uh, and it is a pretty, you know, it's just staggering when you see this. Um, and the people applying for aid have changed dramatically over my career, I think. Um, a lot more in terms of first-time applicants, many more people you know, for lack of a better term, middle class um, coming in. As a matter of fact, I was over at 28th and P not long ago, and I was in the uh, lobby area, which can be a very crazy scene sometimes, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll admit it, okay? Because at that site, we have all of our programs, you know, everything from GA, Medi-Cal, everything else. And um, so it's very crowded and um, chaotic. Um, and then I noticed, though, right in the middle of all of this was a couple sitting there with an infant, presumably their infant, and he's wearing a sport coat and tie, you know, and she's very nicely dressed. And I just stopped and I thought, I wonder what brought them here today. I didn't invade their privacy to ask. It could have been any number of things. Uh, but it was just for me, was a very vivid reminder of how things are changing. You know, this guy was just sitting there very patiently going through all the paperwork, getting ready, waiting for his number to be called. Um, <coughs> 
And I don't think that's that uncommon as to what's going on out there right now. Um, so things have really changed and it has created huge demands on our staff, as you can imagine, because as I was saying, at the same time these caseloads are going up in Sacramento County over the last three years, uh, we've lost more than 3,000 positions. Jobs that used to be there that aren't in county government. And not just all on health and human services, but countywide. I will say the biggest hunk, the biggest hunk of those have been in <laughs> health and human services. So uh, you can imagine the situation. You know, um, if you're a client, what the situation is. If you're a staff person, what the situation is. There. Uh, and we've been trying desperately uh, to deal with that. But I'll, I will say this. Um, I have found firsthand being on the ground that the expression where there's crisis, there's opportunity has really kind of played out because I've seen some things happen that I'm not so sure would have happened if we weren't in this situation. And when I say that, uh, believe me, I, I am not minimizing the impact on clients or the impact on any of these 3,000 people who have lost their jobs. Uh, but um, we're seeing big steps at the fastest pace that I've seen in my career to modernize our processes. A uh, much greater use of technology on a much faster track than I think we're used to uh, in government. Uh, offering web portals, uh, online applications. We've gotten waivers of face-to-face -face interviews. We're using interactive voice response systems. In Sacramento County, we've established a couple of call centers. We're going to establish a third one. Works very well uh, for clients and for staff. Um, Self-service kiosks and lobbies. Uh, we're working to simplify the inter-county transfer process. We've reduced, um, we're working to reduce the effort to complete uh, restoration of aid. So there's a number of things that have been either implemented or in the process of being designed to be implemented um, in, to address this situation uh, that I think will go a long ways and are much better, I think, for the long run, uh, ways to operate our programs. It's all about finding different ways to do our jobs because the need, as I was saying, is very vividly and very clearly there. We encounter it every day. And we can't ignore that need. So in Sacramento and in counties throughout the state, and again, I'd say throughout the country, administrators are really working with their community to try to find those different ways of doing business. It, in, it involves a larger and different role for the faith-based community. It involves a different and larger role for the nonprofit community and it involves a different and uh, larger role for the private sector community. Because this is our community's problem. That's the message that we have to get out there. Uh, you can't expect government to be the answer that it's been in the past. Whether you like the answer or not, that's a different matter, but uh, it's, it's different now. But the need is still there, so we have to find different ways of doing business. I have a quote on my wall, which gets a lot of reaction when people come into my office. But it says, and I, I forget where I got this, but it says, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as unsolvable problems. Uh, and that's the, sort of the philosophy, if you're a local administrator, you have to have, even whether you believe it or not. You sort of have to have that, or you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You know, uh, there just has to be a different way to get these things done. And it, I think that um, the crisis has added to this because, listen, I remember years ago, this ugly meeting I had with the Food Nutrition Service about the need to get rid of the face-to-face -face interview requirement. Um, and now, they're, are they here by the way today? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think they were invited. Uh, uh, they're pushing that and I'm happy to see it. You know, uh, but I remember a meeting that wasn't supposed to be a bad meeting that turned out to be a very bad meeting because we were trying to move beyond that um, and uh, at that time it wasn't uh, going very well. Um, so in this environment, in this environment, for people, particularly at the local level, but I'd say those of you at the state level too, it is critical that we continue our efforts to do as much outreach to the community as we can, look for new ways to do that uh, outreach, and as I said, continue to expand partnerships um, and that sort of thing. Our, our food stamp participation rate in Sacramento County is something that is going very well. We're like, I think, the second uh, best amongst the large counties, it's about, it ranges between 60 and 70 percent uh, participation rate. Uh, that means of those eligible to participate, those who are, I'm very pleased with that. We do a number of things 
and we're always looking for new things to do, but it ranges from uh, some of the media stories that we've done and media releases, encouraging the benefits of CalFresh enrollment, uh, and telling people how they can get on, particularly with these new methods. And don't let anybody tell you that people in public assistance don't have access to technology and computers, because they do. You know, uh, it could be through the library, it could be lots of different ways. Uh, but it's, it's long since it's been time that we need to look at different ways of, of reaching out to people. The days where you have to come into a welfare office and take a number and wait to be served are really should be behind us. And, and we're really trying very hard to get behind that. Uh, but we, we, we provide informational packets to everybody we practically see. You know, I mean, every kind of organization that's having some kind of event, we always get our information out there, provide a table there. Um, um, we've worked with the churches to get information out through uh, their services. Um, I could go on and on here. Um, videos with members of our board, videos with other people telling people how they can get on aid, working with the grocery stores. I mean, it all, it's all about trying to find new ways. I mean, I could dispute, and we get into this debate uh, with the Fed sometimes about what California's participation rate is and how, uh, why it's so low. And um, uh, because I do think there are issues with the methodology being used to develop our food stamp participation rate. Um, when I was with the state, uh, we brought in UC Berkeley, not a very not a conservative think tank, but UC Berkeley to come in and look at the formula for computing the food stamp participation rate that the feds use, and they found serious flaws in it. And again, I remember another very meeting that wasn't supposed to be bad that turned out to be bad, where the feds came and we had this big debate about it. But if you were to add in these, SS, these folks who are now cashed out for SSI, and you assume that, say, 80% of them uh, participated in the program where they're now being cashed out, that would have dramatic impact on our participation rate. Uh, and uh, Carolyn already mentioned the impact of the immigrant population. But that's not the point anyway, to me. Uh, because as I said, in Sacramento, we do pretty good with that, but we still have to do more. I don't want to get too hung up on what the participation rate is, because whatever it is, particularly in this economy, we still have to do more. And we are looking at that. Um, uh, the governor has on his desk AB6, which does some important things in the CalFresh program. Did I say food stamps? How many times did I say food stamps? I, I'm sorry. I can't get used to this um, new name. But I hope personally that he signs that. It has some good things in it. Um, the semi-annual reporting that uh, Carolyn mentioned and some other things. And there is um, uh, provisions in there to do away with CFIS for uh, a food stamp CalFresh recipient, sorry. Um, and that debate about the, the finger imaging has been with us every year that I can remember, okay? Uh, and I don't want this panel to be about that, believe me. Uh, but I want to say to all of you, though, that if folks make the assumption that if he signs a bill, I hope he does, and we get rid of uh, finger imaging for CalFresh, that if you think that's going to fix our, the state's over, overall participation rate issue in that program, you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. We got to do a lot more than that. In fact, when I was director of the Department of Human Assistance here for about five years, every day I had issues with clients or advocates or employees or somebody else. But not once, not once did anybody raise an issue with me, be a client, an advocate, or anybody about finger imaging. Um, so personally, from my own you know, boots on the ground experience, uh, that's not going to be the sole thing that has to happen to increase participation in this program. We've got to do a lot more. We've got to continue the kinds of things that I mentioned, um, and I hope that we do. And for those of you who work at the state level, in the legislature, wherever else you work, um, my plea to you would be is to recognize the situation we're in and do whatever you can to allow counties to have the flexibility they need to try these new ways of doing business. We're really pushing the envelope in some areas, you know? Um, but that's what you got to do. And I um, really go crazy when somebody from the state comes in, particularly if I hired that person when I was at the state. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, which has happened. Uh, anyway, and starts getting into this sort of very rigid way of having to do things and things like that because that's not what this is about now. And um, uh, it, this is the perfect discussion to have in the concept of realignment, too, new roles. That's what, because I agree with Gene, we're not out of the woods on this thing by any stretch of the imagination. We've got a couple more bad years ahead of us at least. So let's work together on this. Let's find new ways of doing business together. And I think that's really the answer.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> that was a great presentation. I much for the whole panel. It was very helpful. Um, so I, I have just a couple quick questions before we open it up to the audience. Um, uh, as some of you know, or the, I, I'm, I'm a former LA Times reporter. In fact, I covered welfare reform back when I was interviewing Bruce back I remember. Uh, back in the late 90s. Um, and you know, as a reporter, you're kind of a bottom line kind of guy. Uh, so where um, my question is, you know, every year for the last several years, we see you know dollar amounts and programs cut. You know, and and um, so I'm looking for some kind of description. Uh, about what does it mean to be poor in California today and and what kind of services, what does the safety net look like for that person today compared to what it was, you know, pick your time, but previously when it was better. And, and, and in particular, are there, any, are there any populations, whether it's kids or working adults or elderly who are, who you think have been most affected um, by, the, by the cuts? So uh, why don't I work back from Bruce? Um, Boy. Um, I'm not sure I remembered all pieces of those, that question, uh, but um, how, you know, um, I think what's happening now is, as I said earlier, that a large segment of folks who are on aid, and I don't have the exact percentages, but there are folks that uh, never had to do that before. You know, their house might have foreclosed, they lost their job. Um, and so that has really changed the dynamic. And so they're coming in not knowing what they're, not having had the experience before, right? And of course, the experience right now is as difficult as it's ever been, right? So they walk into the scene that I described earlier. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully, they may have been able to access our online portal or something like that to make it easier. Uh, they're walking in, and they're finding out that this isn't the answer either, you know? Um, because uh, we talked about the cuts to cow works and other things, and um, uh, so you, what you're finding, I think, is um, in that situation more often than not is desperation and, it, and anger. Sometimes anger. You know, we get to that situation too. You know? And that's different than it was before. I think the intensity of it is different than it was before. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, and that's what we're having to deal with. Mm -hmm. Any others about, in general, what it means? To you? I, 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 kids, I mean, if you look at the population that's been hardest hit, I think really is children. I, we are one out of four California kids are now in families with incomes below the federal poverty line. Every time you hear somebody talk about the CalWORKs program, which is our traditional welfare program, don't think mom, think kids. 80% of the people on that program, 80% of the people on that program our children, because of the policy changes that I mentioned, that share is only going to increase over time. There are all, there's a large body of research in the impact of poverty on children, not only in the short term, but in the long term. I think there's a new body of research which I think is particularly topical to this discussion, and it's kids who spend a spell of time, not their whole childhood on poverty. It turns out that the impact on education, earnings, health status, uh, all of those factors can be just as harsh if you spend a short term in poverty, short time in poverty, as if you spend your whole childhood in poverty. So I think that is certainly uh, very much true. You know, the the longer you go, and I I, I was thinking. Uh, when Bruce talked about his his couple in the waiting room in terms of when you look at the duration of unemployment statistics. And again, this is something that has been particularly significant in this economic downturn is the number of people who are the long-term unemployed. Half of the people who are part of the official unemployed in California, and that means you still have enough hope that you're out there looking for work, have been searching for work for more than six months. A, a third of the state's jobless, which is about 730,000 people, have gone without work for a year. You know, a lot of, lot of things. The, the president, I think, just announced this week that he is going to try to seek action against employers who actively discriminate against people who have become jobless. And that is, you know, I think a real hidden danger for people now is as you go looking for work, if you're not employed, 
employers say, well, what's wrong with this person? If they were a good employee, they, they'd be employed. So I think you know, it is that population of people that have gone without work for a long time uh, and, and children. Uh, are the groups that I think we really need to, to look carefully at. Thanks. Caroline, any thoughts about the, the holes in the safety net that we've seen develop? Or? I do think the safety net has changed. Um, and this started happening well before the recession, but I think has continued during the recession. It used to be the case that most families who got CalFresh um, or at that time food stamps, um, also got CalWORKs and that there was a kind of traditional safety net model where you made use of um, in-kind benefits and cash benefits um, together. But as, as Bruce has said, uh, there are um, many, many more people now making use of CalFresh um, and they have earnings or perhaps they have no income at all. And the USDA just released statistics for the U.S. as a whole for um, 2010 um, approximately 20% of households on SNAP had no income whatsoever recorded. Um, and this is quality control samples, so they're, 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 they're tracking down their sources of income. They're not asking them, do you have income or not? They're tracking it down to make sure they're paying benefits accurately. Um, another 40% uh, or so had earnings. And so really the model, the sort of traditional safety net model, um, has really shifted and, and um, and CalFresh is now the, the sort of broadest scope program, um, which did not used to be the case. Mm -hmm. We have a chart that we put in our annual review of the, the budget, and we've tracked for, for some number of time, years now. And since the federal welfare reform law in the, the mid-1990s, the share of families of individuals in, uh, po below the poverty line receiving cash assistance has dropped by about half. We are you know, no longer, I mean, the, the receipt of, of cash assistance benefits, CalWORKs, SSI, SSP, huh. used to be about half the people below the federal poverty line received some kind of cash assistance payment. We're down to about a quarter. Hmm. Wow. Um, I, another uh, quick question. We have a couple of shoes to drop just in the next couple of weeks, and you, you made reference to the super committee at the federal level, but you know, we have, the state has a, a trigger coming up in its own budget that, um, that has some safety net uh, uh, money on the line. Um, and so I just, looking at, you know, the state, the state has to cut a couple billion in December if we hit that trigger. Uh, and the, uh, the, the Congressional Super Committee is supposed to come up with one and a half trillion dollars of cuts over the next 10 years by November 23rd. So um, I just wondered if you could give some kind of context for of all the shoes that have dropped over the last couple of years, how, how significant are these and, and what do you expect to, um, as a result of both of these steps? Um, do you want to start, Jean? Or? I, I think the, I'll, I'll start with the good news since I've been doing bad news all along. I think the good news about the super committee, which is the committee of six and six, uh, six Democrats, six Republicans, six senators, six Congress people, charged with, with coming up with ways to potentially close the, the federal budget deficit. The good news is, as part of the agreement over the, the debt ceiling earlier in the summer that led to the creation of that committee, uh, the, the traditional low-income entitlement programs, all the ones that we've talked about, TANF, uh, SNAP, uh, at the, which is still a SNAP at the federal level, Medicaid, uh, are not on the table if the committee fails to come to agreement and the across-the-board cuts take place. And that was out of recognition, even in that very hard-fought, pretty conservative deal, uh, that when the economy is tight, we need to protect those programs and that we don't have much of a safety net left and we need to protect what's there. So those programs are off the table at this point in time, although the committee could bring them back in. Uh, Assembly Budget Subcommittee 1 will have a hearing on Thursday. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, um, you know, certainly we're looking at it very closely. I know a number of, of folks in this room are looking at that closely. I, on the state budget triggers, I, I think it's way too soon to tell. Every time people say, well, is the trigger going to pull or not? Way too soon to tell. Um, the stock market, you know, up 
was, was up this morning. I don't know what's happened since I last turned the radio off. You know, we had a good week, bad week. Again, the top end in California, the good news from a state budget standpoint is the top end in California is coming back booming. You know, record low vacancy rates in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is booming. Uh, that's good news for the state budget. You know, let's let's hope for some you know really good IPOs between now and the end of the year, and you know all of those things that will sort of you know be the the make or break numbers for the state triggers. I, I think it's going to be close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bruce. Well, uh, I'll offer the local perspective on this whole question. Um, at least my local perspective. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was aware of um, the provisions at the, at the federal level that protected those programs. Um, uh, I still don't think we're out of the woods on that, and I, but I do find um, I'm happy what Gene just said about what's happening uh, with revenue, that there might be some light at the end of that tunnel, because the trigger cuts concern me as a local administrator very much. Uh, not just the ones that are on the table, which is bad enough, the cross the board reduction to IHSS, with our aging population and everything else, um, uh, but I think that, again, we're not out of the woods yet, and so uh, the triggers are one thing. Developing next year's budget is another thing. Um, so I would just invite any of you folks who are involved in this to, we'll set up time for you to come over to our offices. I mean this. And spend some time. Some of you have, hi Nicole. Uh, some of you have. Um, but please, my biggest concern when I see these cuts, and I've been through these drills, Gene. I mean, I, I used to be in those conference rooms where you had to find X number of dollars by tomorrow at this time. You know, I mean, I've been in those meetings, okay? So I, I can appreciate what that's all about. But remember what I just said, one out of every, more than one out of every four residents in this county is receiving some form of assistance, okay? If you make more cuts to these programs, and I know that the, the options are very limited, but don't forget that statistic. Okay, because the impact is going to be severe. And you can't make those decisions exclusively in a conference room here downtown. Um, so I, I'll, I'll set up time. I'll set up tours. I'll let you talk to clients within all the confidentiality requirements. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> uh, I think that would be very healthy so you, you get the right kind of context. Because I'm, I'm concerned, not just about the trigger cuts, but there's more budgets that have to be, roll out before we're out of the woods on this. And the, and so we might survive these trigger cuts, but there's more cuts out there that concern me. Mm -hmm. Caroline, any thoughts? Or? It does seem to be a double whammy in the sense that um, the, the Recovery Act, the stimulus bill, the federal stimulus bill, increased um, CalFresh benefits by an average of about 13%, I believe. Um, and that um, helped families to afford um, more in their budgets. Um, similarly, the EITC was increased by the federal government. And so for a while, um, the, picture, the safety net picture was a bit brighter because of those federal increases. And now um, we don't know what the future holds um, exactly, but those sorts of increases um, seem unlikely to continue.